All right. <clears throat> hey, guys. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put up the uh, warm up here. And yeah, we'll talk about it at, let's say, like, you know, 512 or something. So um, yeah, and this will be just something for you guys to work on on your own. It should be fairly simple. All right. So um, here we go. Warm up. Solo exercise. Um, yes. Let S N be a sequence. Prove the limb sup. Let's see. Limb sup. The absolute value of S N equals zero if and only if. So two directions to go here. Uh, the limit of Sn itself equals zero. OK? So yeah, uh, we will resume at 5.12. Here we go. Max, See are you, you going to start at Berkeley time, usually? Uh, no, I usually like to at least put up the exercise by, you know, about 5.05. Um, okay. And then I use the, like, initial exercise as kind of like a flexible time for people to come in, you know. So if you come in a bit late, then you might miss some of the time to work on the, the warm up. But that way, um, you know, most of the people are here by the point that we get into, like, the group exercises and stuff. Yeah. Yep. OK.
Hey, all right. <clears throat> so um, let's uh, just go over this real quick. So there's kind of like, you know, there's sort of a long way of going about this, which would just be to kind of work directly from the definitions. So, you know, you could say like, okay, suppose the limb sup Sn equals zero, you know, um, let epsilon be greater than zero, show that there exists a capital N such that for n greater than capital N, we have um, Sn absolute value less than epsilon, right? This would just be using the definition of convergence. And so you'd have to leverage this somehow to argue that this is true, which isn't horrible. I mean, it's, you know, it's already kind of like sort of obvious that this should be the case, right? Um, so you could probably argue easily by contradiction that, you know, if, uh, if this n didn't exist, that would mean there was some epsilon for which there are, you know, infinitely many absolute value Sn, which are bigger than some value of epsilon. And that obviously means that the limb sup would have to be bigger than that value of epsilon or something like that, right? But there is a shorter way of doing this, okay? Um, so actually, right. So um, this is the long or bad, right, way. The short or good way. <laughs> not it's not actually that bad, you know. I mean, I'm just kind of joking around a bit. But uh, so the the shorter way of doing this would be like, okay, uh, suppose limb sub S n equals zero. That means sup s equals zero, where s is the set of subsequential limits, right? But on the other hand, clearly all subsequential limits are greater than or equal to zero for absolute value of Sn, right? Because all the terms of the sequence absolute value of Sn are greater than or equal to zero, right? So if you take any convergent subsequence of that, clearly the limit has to be greater than or equal to zero, right? So S equals zero, right? And we know if S is a singleton set, right? Or whoops. Well, this really shows that um, absolute value of Sn converges to zero, but then, uh, yeah, then Sn itself converges to zero, right? I think we should have showed this earlier. I mean, this is like a fairly trivial thing. Not trivial, but it's like easy to go from this to this. I wouldn't take points off if you were to answer the question this way uh, and not actually delve into the, the this particular step of logic. Um, but yeah, because I think the main thing here is that you can like exploit what we know about the set of subsequential limits and the limb sub, right? To say that once we find that the set of subsequential limits is the, a singleton set, uh, that means you know <clears throat> this set, this uh, sequence has to converge, right? So uh, that's one direction. Are there any questions about that? Could you also argue from definition of like infimum and be like, and then use a theorem that if the supremum and the infimum, the limb sub and the limb inf are the same, um, you, then the limit is the same thing. Um, um, because by that, like, uh, because they're both zero. Um, and then you can say like the supremum of negative SN has to be equal to infimum because zero and then since the limb sub and so, supremum okay. and infimum of that set is the same thing. Yeah, so I think what you're saying is our argument would go like this. So if we suppose the limb sup of this is zero, then the limb inf has to be zero because clearly the limb inf is like 
greater than or equal to zero. Yeah. Right? So then, sure, yeah, I mean, that also works. Yeah, I mean, that's that's basically what this argument is here, right? When we say uh -huh. all subsequential limits are greater than or equal to zero, that is like equivalent to saying that the limit is greater than or equal to zero. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, just slightly different uh, phrasings of the same concept. Um, and then to go the other way, well, the other way is actually like, even easier, right? Because if the limit of SN is zero, then the limit of absolute value of SN is zero. And that just directly implies that the limit sub is zero, right? So uh, that should do it for that uh, particular problem. Any other questions? Okay, so how about I'll open it up now for just like generic questions. Do you guys have any like generic questions about the material so far? Oh, what am I doing? Hold on. Let me try to resize my window a little bit. There we go. <clears throat> OK. No questions? All right. Um, then in that case, uh, it's probably a fine time to do a little bit more substantial of an exercise here, and I'll put you guys into uh, groups with each other. So, yeah. Let's try this one. So, let SN and TN be bounded sequences of non negative numbers show uh, show that the lim stuff. SN TN is um, less than or equal to lim sup SN times lim sup TN. Uh, yeah, let's try that. So let me make the uh, the little groups. <clears throat> uh, all right. Um, yeah, I guess let's do this. There we go. Uh, so yeah, how about we take like about 10 minutes so we can resume at 530.
Hey, all right. So, yeah, this problem, it's not like horribly difficult. It's just you have to be a little bit more careful than you might realize in certain, you know, making certain like deductions here. So um, I'm actually going to sort of start us off here. Um, all right. So let's look at this. So first of all, it'll be useful to introduce some notation. So let's um, let's call this M1 and let's call this M2. All right. Or maybe L1 and L2 or something. Uh, so L1, L2. And um, I mean, I don't know. We don't really have to give this a name, I don't think. So at least here's the approach that I think it's natural to try to take at first. Okay. So, um, so our approach that we might attempt <clears throat> is um, let S and K, T and K uh, be a convergent subsequence of SNTN, right? And show the limit is less than or equal to L1, L2, okay? So if we could do this, and this is actually like, I mean, this approach will work. I think this is the approach that in, to my mind, seems best. I, there may be like some slicker argument that I'm not really thinking of, but, uh, but I think that this is a pretty good um, approach. But the problem is that it's not as easy as it looks, okay? Um, so, because here's what you might try to say, okay? Um, so, attempt. You might say, um, so S and K, uh, the limit of S and K is less than or equal to L1, and the limit of T and K is less than or equal to L2, right? Because L1 and L2 are the limb sops of these two sequences, right? So what's the problem with this argument, right? That would tell us that the limit of S and K, T and K is less than or equal to L1, L2, right? Why can't we use this argument? Anyone? Okay, maybe, maybe you guys all tried to do this, I'm not sure. <laughs> But uh, so we're not allowed to do this, right? Because SNK and TNK might not converge, right? Like just because SNK times TNK is a convergent subsequence of SNTN, right? That doesn't mean that each one of them individually converges. They might both diverge. Obviously, if one diverges, then the other one has to diverge, okay? But uh, it's possible that both of these sequences actually diverge. So this is bad. Because um, the sequences are bounded, mm -hmm. could you pick the subsequences that do converge? Um, uh, okay. It's not as simple as saying just pick the subsequences that, like you're saying basically, you know, take convergent subsequences of the product sequence, which are of the form like, which are products of two individually convergent sequences is what you're saying. So only only examine those two sequences, those types of sequences. Um, I, I, yes, that's kind of what yeah. I was thinking. Yeah, I, I don't, it's not that, so there's yeah there may be a way of doing that but it's like to justify it would be pretty hard i think that like basically because basically what you're saying is that there are no subsequences you can get here which um converge 
like there are no lim there are no subsequential limits of SNTN that come from products of two divergent subsequences that don't also come from products of two convergent subsequences, basically. Okay. Uh, if that makes sense. <laughs> I know it's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, kind of, I'll think about it for a long yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there might actually be an example, like I might actually be able to come up with an example of like why that logic doesn't work. Let me, let me, let me just think for a second, actually. Ah, yeah, yeah, actually, <laughs> um, here's, a, here's a very simple example. Okay, so yeah, actually that logic doesn't work, sorry. So if you just say like SN is like, you know, well, here, I'll just sort of write it out. So like, make it be like, you know, two, one half, two, one half, so on. And then TN is like one half, two, one half, two, so on, right? Then, SNTN literally is like a convergent sequence, right? Um, it's just one, 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 one. And so obviously like any subsequence of that is convergent, but like there is no, oh wait, I guess that's true. Actually you could take, yeah, you can just take, um, in fact, any, yeah, you can take either like the twos and then the one halves from here and then like, or you could take like the one halves from here and the twos from here and you'd have products of convergent sequences. Hmm. Okay, well, I don't know, maybe that, okay. May, so maybe that logic does work, but it's like, yeah, it's, it's hard to justify. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> it's like, it's hard to, uh, to justify why you should be able to assume that, basically what you're trying to do is assume that you can consider SNK and TNK both to converge. Uh, and that's like, difficult to do. Um, so, but here, here's how we can do it. It's, it's, this problem isn't like actually that bad. Okay. So let's look at this. So um, here's what we can say. Um, so let's show that the limit of S and K, T and K is um, less than or equal to L1, L2 plus epsilon for any epsilon greater than zero, okay? So to do that, um, what we can do is say, all right, um, so, Let's take, uh, let me see how to define this. So here, here's, uh, let, me, let me show you like where I want to head with this, okay? So, um, so let's say our goal here would be to say that, um, uh, you know, take um, epsilon one and epsilon two such that um, L1 plus epsilon 1 times L2 plus epsilon 2 is less than or equal to L1, or let's say even like less than L1, L2 plus epsilon, and then say that SNK is less than or equal to L1 plus epsilon 1 for all, or actually and TNK is less than or equal to L2 plus epsilon two for all, for all but finitely many K. Okay, so like if we could do that, right, then that would show that this limit has to be less than or equal to L1 plus epsilon one times L1, L2 plus epsilon two. And then in turn, that would mean that it's less than L1, L2 plus epsilon. 
right? Let's actually just, I don't know, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, so does that, does this approach make sense? I mean, do, do you guys see how this here would give us like what we want? If you can show that the sequence S and K, even though it doesn't necessarily converge, if you can just show that it's less than or equal to L1 plus epsilon one for all but finally many K, and then also T and K is less than or equal to L2 plus epsilon two for all but finally many K, then S and K, T and K is less than L1, L2 plus epsilon for all but finally many K, which means that the limit also has to be less than L1 plus L1, L2 plus epsilon, right? So, uh, so how can we do this? So let me just write out, because I literally actually didn't like work this out on my own, so, or I didn't work this out uh, in detail. I was just thinking about it, but it shouldn't be hard. I mean, I know how to do this. Okay, uh, plus epsilon one, epsilon two. So we want this to be like less than epsilon. So take epsilon one to be less than like the minimum of um, L or epsilon over three L two and like the square root of epsilon over three. Okay, I'll show you. I'll show you. Okay, let, let me let me clean this up a little bit. Um, actually, let, let let me move to a new thing and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So, L one plus epsilon one, L two plus epsilon two, right? This is L1, L2 plus epsilon 1, L2 plus L1, epsilon 2 plus epsilon 1, epsilon 2. And what we want is for this to be, so we want this less than epsilon. And so we want to choose epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 to make this true, right? So take, like, let's make each one less than epsilon over 3. Right. So we can make epsilon one less than epsilon over three over L two, right? See, and then we can also make it be less than the square root of epsilon over three to make this term be less than epsilon over three. So that's why it's the minimum. And similarly, And then here we would have like epsilon over three L one and square root of epsilon over three. Okay, so if we go back over here, I'm gonna erase this stuff. Sorry, this ended up being a bit more convoluted than I was intending. Um, there is one more question after this, which is like a lot simpler, trust me, I, I picked it out. And it's like different, it's about computing some limits. And it's interesting, I mean, I think it's important. Uh, so stick around for that for sure. But we're, we're almost done with this. So, okay. So take, let me just show you how the argument looks. So take epsilon one to be less than, sorry, the minimum of L, what did we say? Epsilon over three L two and the square root of epsilon over three. And epsilon two is less than the minimum of epsilon over 3L1 and the square root of epsilon, oops, square root of epsilon. Oh my God, hold on. Square root of epsilon over three. Okay, so then, okay, uh, SNK is less than or equal to, let's say, L1 plus epsilon one for all, um, let's say all K greater than like K1, right? And T and K is less than or equal to L2 plus epsilon two for all K greater than like K2, right? Then S and K, T and K is less than or equal to L1 plus epsilon one times L2 plus epsilon two for all K greater than 
the maximum of K1 and K2. And what we already know is that we chose epsilon one and epsilon two so that this would be less than L1, oops, L2 plus epsilon, right? So S and K, T and K is less than L1, L2 plus epsilon for all K after this, whatever this number is, right? Which shows that, so the limit S and K, T and K is uh, less than or equal to L1, L2. L1, L2 plus epsilon, but we did this for all epsilon, right? So that actually means that S and K, T and K converges to something less than or equal to L1, L2 itself, right? So yeah, okay, sorry, I'm sorry. This was too hard. <laughs> I shouldn't have, I don't know. I mean, may maybe there's an easier way of doing this. Maybe, maybe the, like, considering only, you know, arguing that you should only be able to look at, you should only have to look at like products of two convergent subsequences. Maybe that's actually easier. I'm not sure. This is just the way that I would do it. Okay. Um, yeah. Do you have any questions about this? I know it's a lot of steps. Um, yes, I, I actually. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I wonder, like, why do we have to emphasize like all the finitely many K? Ah, yeah. So um, because, right. If we didn't do this for all but like if we didn't make this true for all but finitely many k, then um, like we wouldn't know whether the limit of the product is actually less than this, right? Like mm -hmm. if it was if it was true for um, like if it was possibly tr um, untrue for like infinitely many k, then it's possible that the you know that the limit is greater. Actually, I guess it would be enough. It would be enough simply to say that this is true for infinitely many values of k rather than all but finitely many, if that makes sense. Well, what's um, the difference between like all but finitely and? Uh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, actually, I was going to make a video about this uh, uh -huh. to explain this because I've gotten a couple questions about this. So actually, let me let me make a new like thing. Yeah. Okay, all but finitely many. versus infinitely many, right? So on this side, we could have, um, for example, you know, um, all values of n except, you know, n equals like seven, um, eight, and like 23, and I don't know, a thousand, right? So if we if we were saying that something was true for like all values of n except these four values, then that would be saying it's true for all but finitely many values of n. But like here, we could say, um, you know, all even values of n, right? Uh, so that leaves out. all odd values. So here, even if we say something is true for like infinitely many values of n, that doesn't mean that it's true for all but finitely many values of n, right? Because it could still be untrue for like another infinite collection of values, right? It's possible to have like multiple different co like infinite collections of values to get like, so that it's something is true for one of those collections and not true for the other one. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, so, totally. like, you can say like, okay, um, th there's like an order of these things. So uh, you can say for all n greater than n, for instance, that would be strongest. That's the strongest thing you could say. That implies all but finitely many n, which in turn implies infinitely many And, but the reverse implications are not true. Okay, but we usually, these two, these two ones, we kind of consider the same anyway. So like in this case, right, technically, if you said that something was true for every value of n except for these four, um, it's not like directly the same as saying that it's true for like all values of n, you know, past, uh, like, 
you know, past like a thousand, I mean, it is true for all values of n past a thousand or whatever, but there are other cases, there are other values of n for which something is true, right? Um, so actually, maybe I should sort of, th this might be confusing. Just forget about this. Never mind. Okay. Just don't, don't worry about it. Sorry. Right. But this, this one is important. This is actually like a really important distinction that you can say something is true for infinitely many values of n without it being true for all but finitely many values of n. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Uh huh. Very good question. Uh, was there another question? Uh, yeah. So uh, is it possible to just use, uh, what was it, 12.1? Uh, um, and argue that only like as long as SN is convergent to some positive S, then the left side of the equation becomes basically like S times lim sub TN or whatever. Um, I, I don't know if like where the, where the logic breaks Well, down. the problem is that, um, I mean, I'm just not entirely sure how you'd how specifically you'd be applying that in the context of this problem because for one thing we're not cons we're not assuming that sn is convergent right that's like that's kind of the whole reason that this problem is any different from anything else that we've done is that sn and tn here are both allowed to be divergent sequences so like you can't directly say that like well you know like if you just say okay suppose sn converges then this is true okay like if you just say that that doesn't prove it for the for all of the cases that we're interested in right because you haven't said anything about what happens if sn or and tn both diverge right so like you can't directly use that to just solve the problem and uh like the same thing goes with the subsequences where it's like here snk and tnk might both be divergent um subsequences so you can't just sort of like assume that one of them converges um, because if you do that, then you're like weakening your argument and you're not covering a lot of the possibilities of what could happen. So like, if you want to do something like that, what you have to do is justify like why you should be able to assume a certain thing is true by saying like, okay, in all the other cases, like, you know, here's another reason why we don't have to worry about these cases basically, right? And so, but in this situation, it's like the cases where SN diverges and TN diverges and like SNK and TNK both diverge, th that's actually like the hard case to deal with anyway. So like you kind of have to end up making an argument so sort of like this, uh, you know, no matter what. Okay. Okay. Thanks. That makes sense. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So it looks like we're almost out of time, but I really wanted to do, okay. I'm just going to like show you guys something because, uh, <laughs> I think it's important to see. Um, so I'm just gonna like walk you through this like one thing, hold on. So this was gonna be the next problem. Uh, so calculate the limit of n factorial to the one over n and the limit of Oops, one over n times n factorial to the one over n. Okay, so um, this is supposed to illustrate how you can use theorem twelve point two, which is about like the you know s n plus one over s n, and then like s n to the one over n power, right? So um, so let's call this you know a. I'll I'll do these pretty quick. They're not that like they're just a little bit tricky, but they're not lengthy to solve. So, um, so for A, define, uh, sorry, define SN to be N factorial, right? So then, oops, uh, then we know, so by 12.2, lim, lim inf of SN plus one over SN is less than or equal to you know, um, let's just say, let's just like, well, okay, okay. Lim inf SN to the one over N plus or equal to the lim sup SN to the one over N. And I can actually drop these um, absolute values. Oops. 
because everything is positive. And this is less than or equal to the lin sup of Sn plus one over Sn. Okay, uh, right. So let's examine the outer two things, right? Um, the lim inf Sn plus one over Sn is lim inf of just n plus one, right? And this sequence just goes to infinity, so this is just infinity, right? Same thing here. So the lim sub uh, is it, it, same thing for the lim sub, right? They're, they're both infinity. So um, so this is infinity. Infinity, we have infinity is less than or equal to this, less than or equal to this, less than or equal to infinity. So that forces the inner two things, right? To be infinity. Okay? So that's how you can like use 12.2. You don't even have to really, you know, do anything. You don't have to do any like epsilon delta or, or capital M or whatever, any proofs of, of that nature. Uh, you can just use 12.2 to like rigorously, this rigorously shows that the limit of this, of n factorial to the one over n is infinity, okay? Now, the second one uh, is, basically it's the same technique, you just kind of get a different result. So um, let's say in this case, we will define the, uh, um, n factorial over n to the n, okay? And the reason we do n to the n is because, right, here it's like we wanted to view this limit as like the limit of Sn to the one over n, right? So if we want to think of this thing as being Sn to the one over n again, that means we have to move this expression inside of the parentheses and then define that as like Sn. So putting one over n inside here forces us to make it like one over n to the n, Right, so you get Sn is like n factorial over n to the n. So here, right, now we get, uh, so let me erase some stuff. This is this. Um, so now, instead of this here, Sn plus one is now like, uh, you know, what was it? It's, um, so we get uh, n, pl n plus one factorial, so we'll have like n plus one, and then there's like a n plus, what is it? Oh, n to the n, or yeah, yeah, n to the n over n plus one to the n plus one. So then one factor of n plus one uh, cancels out here. So this is lim inf. And now, now we have n to the n, so we have n over n plus one to the n, right? And actually, if you think about this, so this is lim inf of one minus one over n plus one to the n. This expression, okay, I won't, I won't go into it right now, but it's not too hard to show that this approaches one over e, okay? Uh, if you assume that, um, assuming one plus one over n to the n uh, approaches e. Okay, anyway, okay, so this has ended up being a little bit harder than, okay, sorry, sorry, I keep doing this. I'll try to pick a, uh, pick more reasonable problems next time. But anyway, so, so the answer you get here is basically um, one over e, okay? Uh, because, because this is a convergent sequence, so actually the lim inf ends up being one over e, and then the lim sub also ends up being one over e. So then this is like squeezed in between. Uh, so these both have to equal one over e. And if they're both equal to one over e, that means that the sequence itself converges to one over e, right? So uh, yeah. So actually what's kind of cool about this, I, I recommend you actually like think about this problem yourself a little bit. Um, What's kind of cool about it is that this is uh, arguably the basis, or at least it's a primitive version of what's known as Sterling's approximation. So Sterling's approximation 
is very useful and it's very cool. Um, and it says that n factorial is, is asymptotically similar to n to the n over e to the n. And then there's like a one over square root of two pi n out here, but that doesn't really matter. So yeah, if you, if you look at this, it's, it basically captures the main part of this, which is this n over e to the n thing. All right, anyway, anyway, all right, that's enough. Yeah, so sorry for the hard problems. Uh, I promise I'll, I'll tone it down a little bit for the next one. Um, yeah, so see you guys. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, hi, Professor. I wonder when will you have your office hour? Uh, yeah, so I'm going to have one at 11 a.m. tomorrow morning okay. and then another one on Friday from like 5 to 7 p.m. 5 to 7 p.m. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye.